And so one of the things, if you're new, is you don't need to measure every gutter. In this video, I chat with Andy Patterson. Andy has multiple decades of experience as an adjuster at a major carrier, and he has just started an incredible new YouTube channel where he aims to show not only how to scope and estimate property and auto damages, but also how to repair them. Check him out at the YouTube channel, Patterson Adjuster Training, and he's linked where you're watching this video. I've never seen claim handling this poor. And, and I know it's a large event and they're just throwing bodies at it, but it's a, it was a little discouraging that we had so many people wash out. This is Adjuster TV. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Paysetter Claim Service. Learn more at adjustertv.com slash paysetter. e &O provider Kaplik. Download the free insurance for adjusters guide at cplic.net slash adjuster TV and by Crawford Catastrophe Services. Join Adjuster TV at the 2022 Crawford & Company CAT Conference the first week of March 2022 in Orlando. There are literally dozens of training classes including wildfire, flood, and several carrier certifications, among others. Register for the conference right now for early bird pricing. Get full details at crawco.com slash cat and scroll down to the conference link. The full link is in the description where you're watching or listening to this program. Again, Adjuster TV will be attending this conference, so when you sign up, let them know we sent you. Hey, what's up? Matt here with Adjuster TV, and for the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as an independent adjuster, subscribe now. So we thought we'd do some coaching calls um, just to kind of help people through sticking points, whether it's in their career or whether it's in their claims workflow. Um, if you got some general questions about claims, um, for more experienced adjusters like Andy, um, you know, he's got some specific questions uh, about where he's at in his career. Um, and, you know, we're just going to kind of talk through some things. So um, without further ado, here's Andy Patterson. Andy, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of where you're at um, and what you're, you know, sort of what you're hoping to accomplish on this call and, you know, kind of where you're headed or where you'd yeah, like to head. Yeah, appreciate it, Matt. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, thanks for... Uh, bringing me on this coaching call. Uh, you are kind of the gold standard in the industry. I've been watching you for a couple of years now, um, and I appreciate everything that you're doing. I've been in the claims business for about 24 years with a large wow. major carrier. I'm a staff adjuster. Um, over the last couple of years, while I'm working catastrophe claims, I've been a little discouraged, let me tell you why. So I've been doing a lot of service recovery work, agency liaison work, and whenever I get involved, typically you've got an upset customer, you've got an upset agent, and those uh, folks, you gotta go out and do a, it's called a service recovery inspection because somebody screwed something up and I don't really fault the adjuster necessarily because a lot of folks see dollar signs and they get into this industry thinking, oh gosh, I just got my adjuster license so I'm ready to go. The person I really wanna be talking to is not the agent or the upset policyholder. I wanna to talk to that adjuster before they get to that first inspection and kind of get things going sideways right off the bat. And I, I started, I'm thinking about transitioning from my current staff position into a position where I can help new adjusters. So the purpose of this coaching call is I'm starting out from scratch. I want to build something. I, I'm calling it a, a Patterson adjuster training. And I really want to help people. I know money will come secondary. I'm leaving a six-figure job to do this, not for really the money. I'll, and that's just as honest as I can be. I want to help people. I get so tired of seeing new adjusters fail. I remember in Iowa last year working the, uh, the windstorm at the hotel I was at, our a uh, manager would have three or four boxes piled up at, at his door 
in the morning where new independent adjusters due to the stress or whatever, just put their equipment by his door and then they left, they quit. Those people could have been good adjusters if they would have just had a little bit of training up front, a little bit of coaching up front. And so that's what I want to be involved in. And so any advice you can give me for this uh, new venture is what I'm after. Okay. So, well, first of all, let me just compliment you on your set. That looks absolutely amazing. And you clearly (laughs) put some work into it. Um, So bravo, kudos there for sure. That looks, it looks really cool. Especially that, is that the mouse right there? Yeah. Right. Um, Yeah. So, um, and we can certainly talk about like gear and, you know, on the other side of things. I mean, I, I'm sure there's people out there who ha- have some interest in, um, you know, I, I know that there's adjusters out there with YouTube channels and things and social media presence, um, who have questions about, uh, gear, software, and that kind of stuff, which we won't spend a whole lot of time on since this is for claims, but I would say, I mean, for 24 years, um, that's a long, long time. And that is, were you with that same company that whole time? Yeah, I started in 1998 and been with them ever since. Okay. Um, so you, you've worked your way up in, in the, the corporate ladder and and I, I I just have a question for you. and, and, And this is something I think that could be instructive for people who are earlier in their careers. Um, you know, who, who may be contemplating going from, you know, choosing a path, right. Choosing a staff path or choosing the the independent adjusting path. Um, it's, it's been my kind of, um, my experience, I I have a brief uh, staff experience, um, but I could see that there's a ladder there, right. There's a clear defined path where you can take big steps up, you know, and you can climb a ladder and you can be making low, you know, low-ish, you know, slightly higher than low six figures. Um, if you really dedicate yourself to that company, you know, which, any major company, especially if you, if you get a, you know, um, if you get a lot of credentials behind your name, right. I know that big carriers is, and then one in particular that you work for, I know that they've placed a lot of value on that. Um, and that the people that are willing to just kind of like give their soul to the company, can be, will be highly rewarded. Um, but I guess my question would be, you know, is it that bad that you want to leave that behind? Um, and if, what advice would you give somebody who's just starting out and they're saying, hey, should I go staff or should I go IA? Um, what would you say to those folks? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and my situation is a little unique and I, I've always been a transparent person. I started in catastrophe about seven years ago. I was in other claims departments before that. One of the things that I would say about being a staff adjuster is you're you're kind of at the mercy of the company. So sure. if they say, hey, you got to be in Minnesota tomorrow, I got to be in Minnesota tomorrow. And if that deployment is eight months, well, I'm there eight months. I... I think as an independent adjuster, you have a little more flexibility as to what kind of deployments you take. Obviously, you don't want to turn down uh, deployments, but you can say, you know what? Um, I only want to work February through October, let's say. I only want to do field deployments. I think you have a little more flexibility there. I think the training is better as a staff adjuster, but the pay is lower. Sure. But you don't, you're not going to get kicked off a storm. They're going to train you because they have so much money invested in you as an employee, as an independent. To me, it's more cutthroat. It's like, oh, you didn't make it where you're going to get NFA, no future assignments is what that stands for. And then that person with this carrier, they may never not, may never get another assignment. And so there's a little bit of trade-offs. The money is, uh, is better as an IA, but the security is better as a staff adjuster sure. and you have a safety net. 
Hi everybody, my name is Pamela Reed. I am the 2023 president of the National Association of Catastrophe Adjusters Convention coming here to the Rio in January from the 15th until the 19th. We are so excited to be here. We have just ended an amazing conference at the Flamingo. We really, really would love to see you here next year. So please join us at the beautiful Rio. It's a beautiful sunny day. No better place than to be in Las Vegas in January. We'll see you soon. Want to work from home? I thought that might get your attention. I'll cut to the chase here and tell you that the IA firm Paysetter Claim Service frequently has work from home opportunities for the field and also for desk work, which let's be honest, really just means work at home in your PJs. Still want to work in the field though? Paysetter's Evo platform is fully integrated with Hover. It is the best of the app-based claims handling systems out there right now. Technology is moving faster than ever and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. We put together a free guide to maximizing your productivity while working at home in your pajamas, along with a link to apply to this dynamic firm. And you can find both at adjustertv.com slash paysetter. As you well know, when big companies do reorganizations, um, anything can happen. You know, you might be set, you might be told that you're, you know, the territory that you're in just got merged with some other territory and somebody else is, is gonna be handling stuff in that area and you know sorry here's here's a severance or you can go to alabama or you know whatever right. um so to to be you know totally transparent about the whole thing i think that nothing is safe like purely like completely totally safe um, however um you're right um and i totally agree that there's there's a if if you're there's a, like I firms let's put it this way I firms on major catastrophes have limited resources to help people new people um, the carrier you know you guys you're you, some carriers have a lot of resources to help new independent adjusters but they also have resources to help their own staff people and if if you start to spin out there's going to be a lot of help there you've got a team right so the, you're always checking in with your with the team. Um, on the IA side, you have a team, but it's you could on a big uh, like hurricane deployment, like a really big one, like you know Sandy or something like that. You have right. no idea. You could be kicked around to a different team, and you might get an email on Monday from somebody saying, "Hey, I'm your field, you know, your field support manager. Uh, if you got any questions, or you know, let's do some ride-alongs or whatever. Here's my here's my contact info." And then on Tuesday, get an email from somebody else saying the exact same thing because they just shuffle stuff around. People come and go. Like, I mean, it's 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 chaos. Let's just put it that way. Um, yeah. You know, the training the training resources. Um, I, I hear people sometimes, and you tell me what you think about this. Um, they'll say, well, you know, what you should, you should do is go become a staff adjuster at a big carrier, let them train you and work there for like six months and then quit and go be, go be an IA. Like, what do you think about that particular piece of advice? Uh, hmm. It's probably not a bad deal, but I'm a little bit uh, old school. I'm a little bit loyal. So if that was my goal, I would probably just stay on track just to be an IA and just forget about getting the training with the uh, the carrier and then quitting and going somewhere else. Because that, that costs a lot of money for the carrier to bring you on That's as an right. employee to train yeah. you. But, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it per se because there are no guarantees them bringing you on as an employee that you won't get fired. But on the flip side, there's no guarantees that you're going to stick around. You do have to get training. That's what I've been seeing is a big problem. I just finished up a four and a half month deployment working Hurricane Irma. And I now granted all the all the files that I was involved in, there were problems, but I've never seen claim handling this poor. And, and I know it's a large event and they're just throwing bodies at it, but it's a, it was a little discouraging um, that we had so many people wash out. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, how many other like major like cat events like that have you personally like been on? Like how's it compared? How does is Ida like unique in that way? Or is it just kind of par for the course? 
Yeah, kind of like what you said, it's chaos. I mean, you've worked large events like Irma, Michael, Florence, um, work those. It's kind of like controlled chaos. I think what you preach is first contact settle. All of the problems that I, most of the problems I dealt with, if that person would have first contact settled, it would have been great. But yeah. I had one uh, independent adjuster get tra uh, tracked down in Target by a policyholder wanting to know where their estimate was. And this was four Yeesh. weeks later. Yikes. That's, that's not good. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> that was terrible. And a lot of this stuff, <laughs> a lot of this stuff isn't, a lot of it's common sense. Like don't talk to policyholders with your sunglasses on, tuck your shirt in, don't right. pull up in a, a Mercedes with a, a foldable ladder. Now you may be the best adjuster in the world, but whenever you pull up, they think immediately, okay, this person does don't know what they're doing. This is their first storm. Before you leave their driveway, I guarantee you they're on the phone with the agent requesting a second inspection. Yeah. That's just how it is. If you pull up in a pickup truck, probably a different story. Yeah. Or something that's just forgettable, right? Just like a late model sedan or SUV or like a midsize pickup truck or whatever that's like white or, you know, green or something that's just nobody just going to notice it. But if you pull up in, and I've, adjusters do this, they get the, their first few big paychecks and then they decide, I got to have a brand new, you know, Dodge Ram 3500 with chrome and, you know, shiny wheels and a lift or, or, a, or a Yukon or something that's got, it looks like the president's motorcade pulls up when they, you know, they roll up. Um, yeah. And that, first of all, I mean, putting all those miles and all that's, that's a lot of wear and tear on a vehicle. And especially for an expensive one. And second of all, you, you know, if the, if the home, if you go to the homeowner's house and you, you flub their claim or you deny it or whatever, and they look out and they see a Mercedes sitting out there, you know, and you're putting a little telescoping ladder in the back of the trunk and you just, you just walked off denying their claim. I mean, they're going to be, well, you know, I can see where all the money that I'm spending on this insurance coverage is going and they're not going to pay me because they want to pay. The adjusters are all driving Mercedes. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those common sense things. And I know a lot of carrier certification trainings, they cover that. They say, listen, you know, let's just keep it forgettable. You know, it's like the, the, the most, um, like stealth vehicle you could drive in New York city is a yellow cab, you know, it's just like, it's, yeah, just, you don't remember what it was, right. It, Cause it's nondescript. Um, so I guess as far as like, you know, you're thinking about transitioning to, um, Becoming an independent adjuster, correct? Yeah, basically. I want to do, I want to start a YouTube channel. And what I want to do is put some good content out there. What, what my goal is, is to show people how to do an inspection. Like I've got a house, they have a, a fireplace uh, leak, got some drywall that's damaged. It's in a, uh, it's called a bonus room in their house. What I want to do is I want to, do the inspection, film me doing the inspection, then uh, show people how to write the Xactimate estimate. But then I wanna go and do the actual repairs. So that way a new person or even an experienced person can see the whole process from start to finish. Sure. A lot of training out there involves scoping, writing the estimate, but the piece that's missing, I think for new people that don't know anything about home construction is gosh, what does a contractor really do Right. Uh, is this a hand texture? Is this a um, machine texture? What is it? And I think that will uh, bring the repairs and the estimating the inspection full circle. Do you think that would be helpful to folks? I do. And, and you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but, you know, when people say, well, how do I learn construction? Because construction is a big piece of it for property claims. It's a really, really big piece of it. You have to have some mm -hmm. fundamental knowledge, right? So you can... You know, pick right. up a book on basic framing and basic wiring and all that kind of stuff and, and have your eyes glaze over as you're going through it. Or try to like look up YouTube videos on, you know, uh, what you just name it, your roof replacement or windows or whatever. And what you're going to find is they tore off an old three tab and put on, you know, wood shake or metal shingles or something like that. Um, or they, 
pulled off the, the vinyl siding and replaced all the siding with hardy plank, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not what we typically do if we're not wrapping a house or whatever. We want to be able to see like repairs, right? Like, is this repairable or do you have to replace it? We want to see, all right, so they're only going to replace this one side of siding, um, a vinyl or steel or whatever it is. And what do they do when they tear it off? What comes off with it? Right? What, they, what happens to the nails and the debris? Um, what do they do when they get to a corner? What do they do around windows? Um, there's no right. videos out there that show that, that I know of. Um, or in no place where there's, they're like collated together and it's like a curated like sequence of, and, and I'll be totally transparent with you. We've actually shot some of that stuff. Um, we don't, it's by no means comprehensive. And I don't think we'll ever be able to make it totally comprehensive because there's just so many things. Um, so 100% Andy, if you can do that, if you can be like, all right, well, here's, you know, here's the policy considerations, here's customer service considerations, here's the scoping and the estimatics part of it. And now here's what it looks like when the guy's going to come out and do it right. Water spot on the ceiling, one of the most common claims. And as you know, probably one of the most screwed up claims. Um, so simple, but people write the wrong thing. They don't, you know, or they don't write it at all. Right. But they, they need to know, you know, do I need to scrape the whole ceiling of popcorn texture, uh, or just the area? Can I blend it? Can it, will it, how does it, what does it even look like? You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, Head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. You know, what kind of a machine do they use? What's going to happen to the, you know, because you, the, one of the big ways that this helps besides the fact, and I'm really, I get I'm excited about this because I, I, I think you're absolutely, you're onto something, um, is because not only does it inform like how you write the estimate, Right. So you can you can imagine the process in your mind because you've seen it in a video. Right. right. If, if you're not going to be able to get on a job site um, or follow a, con a contractor around. But also when you're talking to the homeowner, because the homeowner doesn't know. Right. So you say, all right, here's what's going to happen next. I'm going to write this up right now uh, or I'm going to go back to my, my office and write up and then call you or whatever. And then. Here's what you do. Here's how you deal with the contractor. If the contractor's not there, you know, you sign a contract, you pay a deposit. And then what's going to happen is, is he's going to put you into his, you know, his production schedule and they'll stage the materials in your driveway. There'll be a dumpster. They're going to put tarps around, you know, the guys are going to come out and then they'll, they'll peel off the shingles. They'll peel off the felt. They'll hammer in, you know, nails that are not loose. They'll mag pull up, you know, so they'll, you can sit there and explain everything that's going to happen to the homeowner so that they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So they're going to have it done in a day, right? A roof that nobody takes more than a day yeah. to do a roof unless they're not any good. Um, you know, and then you can also have intelligent conversations with the contractor and you can negotiate with them. You know, you, you can look at a job and say, I know we need to do the drip edge. We need to do the ice and water. We need to do the ridge. We need to do the, these events, those events, the chimney flashings, fine right and then or, and there's the, the step flashing on this this dormer is fine and then the guy wants to battle you on step flashing and chimney flashing oh we're gonna have to replace the siding and because you know because you can't get that flashing out of there without pulling siding off and if you pull the siding off you're gonna damage it so we're gonna have to wrap the house right and you got that guy right so you can have an you can negotiate with that guy and say you know well i don't think that's gonna you know however you want to do it but you can you can have an intelligent conversation with that person. I think it's great. If you could pull that off, I'm not going to ask you how you're going to do it um, because I don't want to like let your secrets out or anything, but do it, please. 100%. We need it. Coming soon. Yeah. So you tell me off the air, off air because I'm, uh, that's, yeah, yeah. Or, or whatever. I mean, I don't know if it's that big of a deal, but um, so 
to, to I guess long, long, long story short, um, which is my way. Um, yes, we need all of the um, experienced, um, well-produced uh, content that we can get our hands on in this, this industry. Um, there are a lot, there are, I should say a lot, there's a handful of uh, sort of independent adjuster YouTubers and influencers. Um, and I think a lot of them do really, really great stuff. And a lot of them focus on certain specific things. Um, a lot of, you know, they might really concentrate on the career part and the getting started part, um, which is great. And we need that for sure. But we also need, we also need to have, um, the part that comes after that, which is the, you know, whether it's hands-on training or whether it's really, really high quality, um, video training, um, online training, what have you, um, and this, I think it can go for like, if, you know, as an adjuster, you know, when I was five years in, um, I absolutely could have 10,000% benefited from, from watching videos of, uh, you know, removing and replacing steel, like steel shakes, like steel roofing. That's not panels. Right. Um, right. cause then I would be able to see it in my mind's eye. And when I get into a, a neighborhood with, you know, three quarter of a million dollar houses and they've all got th those metal roofs on them, then I can write a great estimate that way. Right. Um, water spots on ceiling. That's always a question mark, right. Or, 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 uh, you know, you've got water damage in a house and there's a, a medium hand texture on the walls. Can you blend that? Or do you have to scrape every single square inch of the walls in the whole house? Right. Um, I want to be able to see that so that I can write my estimate properly. And when the insured asks, I can explain exactly what the guy's gonna do when he comes. Um, so yeah, totally, totally do that, please. <laughs> yeah, and you bring up a good point as far as uh, knowing what you're talking about with the contractor. What I always do is I always, of course, I'm a nerd for this stuff. I've got some small mock roofs that I built in my backyard and I built an ice ball launcher that I do my own tests because- Nice. I just, I hate explaining things that I don't know about. And so when I first started doing catastrophe work um, and I first started homeowner claims, I wanted to know all about this stuff. But one of the things that I do that you can build credibility, and I've had homeowners come to me after the contractor left and said, uh, you know what, Andy, I really kind of believe what you're saying versus what the contractor is saying. One of the easiest yeah. things you can do is the starter strip. If you notice a starter strip where they just flip a, sh a three tab shingle around, well, if they do that, that seal strip isn't where it should be. And so that first course of shingles doesn't have any seal strip. If you can point that out to the policy holder and to the roofer, and I've done it, it automatically, they think, huh, this guy knows what he's talking about. Any little thing that you can bring up and be credible, sure. know what you're talking about. It just builds so much credibility with you and the policyholder. Because what happens is the policyholder, and you know, when you have the contractor there and the policyholder, the contractor says, hey, we'll talk after Andy leaves. So they have right. this little conference after I leave. Um, and so they go over all kinds of stuff, but at least you know what you're talking about and you can go through the scope and even if you may not even pay for a roof but if you look like if you know what you're talking about and the policyholder has a decision to make do i believe the roofer roofer do i believe the salesman or do i believe andy right so it's kind of how you carry yourself and i, th I think that's where a lot of new people get tripped up um, as soon as a contractor sees something on a new person's estimate, like maybe they had three tab shingles, and so they did a line item for removing three tab shingles but putting laminate back on. Well, as soon as the contractor sees that, he's going to point it out to the policyholder, and he's going to try to get a reinspection or get some other stuff that maybe not is not warranted. So if yeah. you can do some homework and learn about this stuff it just helps you in the field and sorry i just went off on a tangent there but i get excited about this stuff no no it's you're absolutely right and uh i think that um you know when you're talking to, to the homeowner and you're talking to the contractor you know that th there's there's a lot less pushback 
if the contractor believes that you know what you're t- you at least have a baseline of knowledge and that you you know kind of what you're talking about um and the same goes with the homeowner um and and again i mean it, it's it's as much you know having that knowledge as it is having a confidence to talk about it um because the second the second whether it's the homeowner or a contractor or whoever salesperson or agents even um they think that you're you're sort of like not confident about what you're what's coming out of your mouth you don't quite believe it or you're not sure it's blood in the water right they're gonna it's it's all over forget it you, you, it's managers it's agents it might be the department of insurance if you got the if you have that perfect storm of all the wrong personalities coming together at once and then you're like well i'm not yeah. exactly sure i think this is what we sh-, you know forget it um so uh as far as like, you know, you being with a company for 24 years, um, and then you're, you're wanting to, to help, uh, adjusters. And it's, it sounds like primarily independent adjusters. I mean, because the company you're coming from probably had great training. Um, what sort of advice would you give to, um, independent adjusters who are just getting started out, on um, the things that you've seen that uh, if they just did it, if the if the new adjuster or even an experienced adjuster, IAs, experienced IAs, you know, they still screw things up. Um, if they had just these like baseline skills or these things lined up, or if they did this instead of that, that the claim would have been, you know, like earlier you were saying, you know, if they just closed on site, it would have saved like a you know, all this headache and everything yeah. else. What are some other things that you could kind of, you know, share for, for new folks or even experienced adjusters who, you know, drop the ball? Cause they do, we do 100%. I've done it. I mean, yeah. And I have too, it just goes with the territory. One of the things that I do, and this may sound silly to some folks is I write pra- practice estimates in my downtime. I go to exact domain. You are a nerd. <laughs> Did you know that there is an adjuster school out there that has a full catastrophe property claims deployment simulation that you can sign up for for training? Let's talk about this. Veteran Adjusting School in Sedona, Arizona is just such a school. As a licensed vocational school, Veteran Adjusting School trains you to become a complete insurance adjuster. When you graduate from the Voss trained insurance adjuster program, you are ready to begin your exciting new career, whether as a daily adjuster or as a cat adjuster. Listen, there are many outstanding adjuster schools out there and you've got to get trained somewhere. Voss stands out among its peers for the depth and breadth of its program, which is a six week catastrophe deployment simulation complete with claims assignments, insured interactions, real damage that you can scope, as well as its continuing support and mentorship long after graduates become working adjusters, all of which provide a significant advantage to you. I mean, there's truly nothing else like it. Go to adjustertv.com slash VAS now and chat with an enrollment specialist who will answer all of your questions and help you decide if VAS is the right choice for you. Again, go to adjustertv.com slash VAS. I, I just love that stuff. and. And I don't, I don't know why I've, even at the, uh, the company I'm at, I've had several people calling me and asking me, um, just training situations and they look at me like a resource and I didn't advertise that. It's just, I have an inquisitive mind and I want to always be learning. So what I would do, if you're new getting into this industry, if you get your adjuster license and you think you're ready to go, please do not take a deployment. Now, if it's a small hailstorm, maybe, but the worst thing you can do if you get your license and that's all you've got is is volunteer to go for Hurricane Irma, something like that, because you're probably going to get kicked off the storm and you're probably not going to get any assignments with that carrier. Get your license, go see Mad the Adjuster TV. You've got some great resources out there. Um, go to there's some youtube videos out there you need to learn how to do an inspection what that process looks like learn how to write an estimate a competent complete estimate practice the discussion with the policyholder matt there's so many things that can trip up a new person 
most of the hurricane claims you're going to see is some damage to some siding, some shingles missing, uh, maybe a few leaks on the inside. That's 90% of the hurricane claims you're yeah, going to see. 100%. So practice writing those kinds of estimates. Um, look at the policy. That's another thing. One of the things that uh, trips new people up is ALE. What does the policy yeah. say about that? How is it paid? Tree debris removal. That's another one. I was in Homa uh, a couple of months ago, and I there was four independent uh, adjusters there. This was a first storm. They all had their license. And they said, we're ready to go. Uh, they, they were working a customer care tent and they were hoping to get out in the field. I said, well, I hope you guys don't get sent to the field. And they're like, why? We got our license. I said, you guys aren't ready. I said, what do you, what can you tell me about tree debris removal? And I said, what's that? And you exactly. know, Matt, in a hurricane, <laughs> you're going to get that question probably in the first five minutes is when you make yeah. contact with the, the policyholder. Yeah. There's so many things that they need to be prepared for. Your channel is probably the best resource out there for folks um, to prepare them um, for what, what they're going to get into. It is a great career. I've been a staff adjuster, so I'm a little bit, uh, it's a little bit different for me, but it's been a great job. But gosh, if I was a new independent adjuster, I just wouldn't take anything unless I got my license and some additional training. Um, yeah, and I, I totally, I totally agree with that. Um, I think that that people, it's frustrating, and I think a part, a big part of our problem is, is that you know whether they hear about this this particular you know independent claims property property claims cat. Um, whether they hear about it on YouTube or social media, or like m a lot of people do from their brother-in-law or their neighbor, you know, like, you know, a guy might be, you know, taking the trash out in the morning and his neighbor's, you know, backing his pickup truck out of the driveway. He's got ladders on and bins and stuff in the back of his truck. Hey, where are you going, Bob? Oh, I'm going down to the hurricane to make a bunch of money. Right. Really? Yeah. You want to go? Right. So, and then that guy, yeah. he might go, right. Um, a lot of people go on their, their first, their first deployment is they heard about the independent claims, uh, five days before the hurricane or the day before. And they, so they call in and the guy, the, the dispatcher, the, uh, <laughs> are you afraid of heights? Do you have a ladder? Do you have a laptop? Then get your butt to Miami right now. Go now. Do you have a vehicle? Go now. Um, so, it is chaos and it's, I would even say it's very controlled. Um, but my, my kind of my point here is that, um, this is a great career. It's a career where you can absolutely make great money. You know, whether you, you slog it out at as a staff adjuster for years and years and years and kind of claw your way up. Um, or you do the same thing as an IA and you get your brain wrapped around sort of being your own boss is which kind of, I think is probably the primary difference between the two things is that we can, I can say yes or no when somebody calls me to, to go work claims, I would always say yes, um, as a sort of like a business decision. Right. Um, but in order to, to make that, to make good money, to make, you know, 80,000, 120, 180,000 maybe, right? Um, you have to close a lot of claims, right? Especially on CAT. Um, daily, you can still do really, really well on daily. It's a whole other ball game. So I'm, I'm just talking about CAT here. But IAs can make a lot of money as CAT adjusters, but they've got to, they've got to close a lot of claims and they've got to be good quality claims. And the bigger the claim, the better, right? So then this this means you know you're kind of pushing up into commercial stuff or condo, farm and ranch, that sort of thing, um, large loss, anything, right? But you're not going to get there to the point where they're they're giving you a lot of volume if you don't have training, right? If you're not if if you just get a license, get a, a level two Xactimate certification, and be like, I'm in, I'm, let's go, let's do, I'm, you know, I'm going to crush it my first year, I'm going to, you know. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field 
or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now it's sink or swim and you've got like 200 pounds of concrete chained to each one of your ankles. Right. And the bottom is yeah. way, way farther than you can, you can, there's not, there's no, it's, it's not easy, right? You've got a lot of things going against you. So my advice to people, and it sounds like it's, you know, you're, you're in alignment with this, but it is, don't don't go get your Xactimate level two or three certifications because you think it's going to look good on a resume. Don't get this this you know particular certification or that particular certification because you think it's going to be something that the the firms want you to have. Get those things for yourself, and you know don't just get Xactimate certification because that's just going to teach you like where stuff is in Xactimate, right, and how to use Sketch. Right, it's not going to teach you how to use Xactimate in the context of a claim. So exactly what you said practice, right? Pretend you got five shingles blown off the roof and write that estimate, scope it, take pictures, you know, import and label the photos, write a diary entry, do a GLR, do all that stuff, right? Um, water spot on the ceiling, same thing, right? And you'll start to build muscle memory because it's repetitious to get that volume, right? That's that repetition over and over again. Um, it's where you start to build that speed so you can close a lot of claims, get more claims on your deployments, get more deployments, right? Um, that's, that's where that, those lines cross between the desire to make a bunch of money and the actual doing it, right? It's, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. Spend the money on training. Veteran Adjusting School, I'm gonna throw out a plug for those guys. Um, if, you've, if you have the resources or, or you have access to the resources, it is expensive, but it is, by all accounts, every firm that I've ever talked to will take a veteran a, adjusting school graduate uh, before anybody else. And they'll put them to work immediately, like immediately. Yeah. Guy Grand was telling me, he's like, you know, the, the average time between graduating from Voss and getting first claims is 22 days. This is as of this past year, right? That's not even a month. Right. And you, you could be working. Wow. Um, the firms will call you because all the major firms are know about veteran adjusting school. They trust the guys that come out of there and the gals and they, uh, they, they, they kind of fight over the graduates because there's only a limited number of people that go through that school. But I can tell you right now, this is for people out there, you know, um, if you want to get the best training, the absolute best training and get a laptop with a year's worth of Xactimate, you know, as part of the package, uh, veteran adjusting school is the way to go. 100%. It's a six week ish program. It's a simulation, right? You're going to get an Xactimate level two certification at the beginning. And then they're going to put, they're going to, it's, you're like on a, you're on cat, right? They, he assigns you claims. You have to make, you have to call insured. You got to go and meet them. You got to meet with, you know, you, you got to, you have to do everything that you would do on, on cat. You're going to go through file review. You're going to get, you know, people are going to yell at you. People are going to be nice to you. Um, it's a, it's about as realistic as you could get without actually going on cat. If you go through veteran adjusting school, spend the money on it. It's still a fraction of what a bachelor's degree costs or even an associate's degree. Um, and it's not two to four years or eight years or whatever, you know, we're not, putting satellites in orbit, right? 
Um, but I would say more than anything, if, if a person is very serious about this and they really want to give themselves the best opportunity to, um, the best chance at really crushing it, go to vendor adjusting school. If you can't go there, go somewhere, get hands-on training, hands-on training for sure. Um, you know, the caddy, the cat institute.com, um, they're down in Fort worth and they've got, I think, you know, multi-day, I don't know if they got multi-week, but they've got, um, full hands-on, you know, they're going to, you're going to learn construction. You're going to learn scoping. You're going to learn some policy stuff. You're going to learn how to use Xactimate. Um, Veil training solutions, uh, is where I went back in the day, back in 99, um, there's mile high adjusters. I mean, there's, you, there's a bunch of schools out there, but wherever you go, spend the money don't be afraid to spend the money. Don't be back and forth on it. If you got to borrow the money, borrow the money. I borrowed the money, you know, and paid the guy, you know, my father or my father-in-law, my stepdad, you know, he, he loaned me money to go to, to Vail and I paid him back the next summer. Right. Just here's cash. Thanks. I appreciate it. You know, I'm off to the races. Um, so do what you gotta do, um, but get trained. 100%. It's so important. And the more resources that we have, Andy, um, on YouTube, on, you know, social media, whatever platform that we can, the better. Um, and I will tell you, if, if you're really serious about um, jumping into the YouTube world and creating content, the number one thing that you can do, um, I think this is one of your questions, um, is get known, right? And you can take notes here. Huh? <laughs> oh, thank you. Right. And the, and the way you get known is that you show up and you generously give your knowledge to the viewer, right? That's how I started doing this. And I think any, any YouTuber who's got a, a, you know, a big following and that is trusted is, is somebody who starts with, um, giving all of their information and all their knowledge and experience and, you know, like bite-sized pieces, you know, five to 15 minute long videos or whatever, pick a topic and talk about it. Um, uh, but giving that free generously, right. Um, later on, um, and this is sort of the path that I took, I would, it, would talk to my people, my viewers, right. My people in my audience, people would email me and ask me questions or they, you know, DM me or whatever. Um, and I started to kind of get a feeling for, um, where everybody's big pain points were. Um, and then that's where I started to build my like more advanced training, the stuff that I was charging for. And I, and it was, you know, I didn't launch adjuster TV plus until I think it's been going for, this will be the second year. So 2020, I, started I remember first, by the way. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I think I started it in like the, the summer of 20, 2020. So this is like, this will be going on in June or July, it'll be two, two full years. Um, but I, I started, I judge TV in 2018. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been a, a, a little while from the beginning until I got, I, I put something out there that people actually, you know, find a lot of value. in. I have another course. It's a time management course, um, that no matter how much I talk about it, people, you know, they're not, they don't seem to be that interested in it is what it is. Um, I share my, how, how fast I, you know, I was a fast adjuster, right? I was one of the guys that was fast. Um, but I, I, I was only fast to the point to where it didn't degrade my claim quality, my customer, my customer service, yeah. um, which is, it's a balance, right? So that course is what that's all about. Um, it's hard to sell it because it's hard to say, well, time management's the most important thing. Here's actually how you do the time management piece, right? But every training that I've ever been to, and you, you know, concur probably, um, they will say, well, you know, you got to be really organized and you got to be really good at time management. And that's all they say about it, right? And now let's talk about windows, right? They don't ever tell you how to do it. They just, once you, they throw you out into the, the, to the wolves, you know, you've got it in the back of your mind. Well, I got to be organized and I got to have good time management. How do I do that? And then you spin out, right? Because nobody showed you how to do it. Um, but yeah, so so to kind of circle back, give your knowledge freely. Show up once a week on, on your chosen platform. I pick one. Um, and whether it's YouTube or Rumble or Twitch or TikTok or whatever it is, Facebook. I don't know that it matters that much. Um, but just be there once a week, every week, 
from now until you decide you don't want it to have Patterson, you know, claims training or whatever anymore, which until you're done with it, show up every single week. Yeah, I've shown up every single week, um, maybe missed one, right? Because of travel or things going sideways somehow. Um, but those, those are the things, those are the biggest pieces of advice I would, I would suggest. Get long measurements with the best, most durable tapes for commercial and industrial use. That means you, Adjuster. Use code ADJUSTERTV at checkout for a discount on anything at ustape.com. As an independent adjuster, do you feel like you only have bad, expensive choices for health insurance plans? And when you have to use the insurance, you'll have to pay a lot out of pocket? Makes you wonder why you even have insurance in the first place. The stakes are high. Having no coverage puts you and your family at risk. It doesn't have to be this way. You want peace of mind with common sense health coverage you can count on that doesn't include things you don't need. You need real insurance with world-class protection from established carriers, not health sharing and not cobbled together prepaid medical. And you shouldn't have to wait for it. Get approved in days, not weeks. There is no risk and no cost to see if you qualify for these high quality plans. Not everybody will qualify, but you've got nothing to lose by getting a free consultation. Visit adjustertv.com slash health for more information and to apply. It looks like you got the gear lined up. Um, it seems like you got a light going and I don't know what kind, what kind of camera you got in there. It's a uh, Sony ZV-E10. Okay. It's a, uh, it's a uh, Canon M50. It's Sony's, ver Sony's version of oh, that. Oh, okay. okay. DSLR. Yeah, I've been watching okay. a lot of think media videos, so giving them right? a plug. Yeah, those guys are good. Um, yeah, Video Ranking that? Academy, that's pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and again, it's, it's just like getting into claims, right? You, you're, you're out there looking for information and you're trying to find the most trustworthy source. If you, if you want to help people, then you become the most trustworthy the trustworthy source, right? And I again, we talked about this when we were at, when we were at NACA. I think I talked to you about this, but yeah, I don't consider anybody to be my competition, right? Not because I'm like I think I'm better or anything, but just because I want people in here um, with sharing their perspective, their point of view, um, because everybody it's you know it's there's one kind of main track you can go down, but you can go down in different ways, right? So you know the Andrew Patterson way could be a little bit different than the Matt Allen way uh, or the you know whoever else is out there way, right? Everybody's got their kind of their little, and, and also their sort of like personality, right? So people may like watching you more better than they like watching me because they, they think you're funnier or you're better looking or whatever, right? I do it. Like when I was learning like digital marketing and stuff, there was like influencers and people that I was like, look like they got great info back. A person's voice drives me straight up the wall. I can't, I can't even with that person. So I'm going to go over here to this other person. Um, that's, you know, totally random, but so I, I, I think you're on a, the right track, Andy. And I, and I, I want you to, uh, I want you to do it because the, the construction thing, doing the restoration piece is massive, especially if you're, you know, it's just, if, if you're videoing yourself doing the repairs and talking through it, right. That's, that, that's gold priceless yeah one of the things I, I really appreciate about your channel is the video content is excellent i can't stand those youtube videos where you guy we have a guy in his garage and you got junk falling off the shelves and <laughs> he's got his his iphone taped to a dowel rod or something right and his cockeyed your video is is great and uh, that's what I've always appreciated about you. Um, your adjuster TV pro, uh, plus is fantastic. Um, you're, like I said before, you're the gold standard. I've talked to a lot of independent adjusters who've mentioned you, um, but a lot of this is um, the responsibility falls on the person that wants to make this a career to check out your channel. I watched a video with you and Guy Grant, and Guy Grant says, if you get your adjuster license, you're not going to get into this industry unless you're unless you expect to spend some money. And that's true. Yeah. 
you don't have to get a college degree, a technical uh, school, a welding school. You don't right. have to do any of that. But you do have to spend a little money yeah. to get prepared. Got a little skin in the game for sure. One of one yeah. of the things I wanted to ask uh, mention is you mentioned um, about these adjusters coming to independent firms after going to uh, Voss and being prepared. Yeah, it seems like we should have some sort of industry standard where we could test these folks. Uh, <laughs> these. <laughs> Don't some you think sort that of would be a like good a, thing if we I don't know like some sort of score. score? Yeah. I yeah, know. like Maybe a that's... like a ranking system or have you heard anything about anybody doing that? Could be like something like an adjusterscore.com. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. we, so thank you for bringing that up, Andy. I appreciate that. Um, and we'll you know, we'll I'll talk about it for just a minute and then we'll kind of wrap up cuz I got another call here in just like 10 minutes, but um, adjuster score is is, is sort of a way to take all of the all the things that, that you've learned as an adjuster, um, as a new adjuster, or even an experienced adjuster, um, and prove it. Right? It's it's proctored, so it that means that it's if when you're taking it, uh, the property exam, for example, that you have to show your ID, you have to do facial recognition. There's a whole bunch of security things that they do, um, so that. Everybody knows that your whatever score you get on an exam is your score, right? It's not it's, you. You started the test and then had your brother, who's an experienced adjuster, take the test for you. Um, the firms va place a lot of value on that. Um, not to say that we don't trust people or that it's it's going to be commonplace, which I don't think it is. Um, but I think it provides a layer of security for everybody, for the adjusters to feel like. You know that the firms are going to believe that th their test is legit, um, and the and the firms are going to trust that the the, the test is legit. Um, we have a lot of ways that adjusters can gain points, right? Not just with their score or their their exam test score, which is, is not pass fail by the way. It's just this is what you know. Um, you can get more points and build up um, sort of your profile by showing proof that you have, you know, licenses, right? And every license that you get will have a points value. Um, gear, certifications, you know, Xactimate, Haig, you know, rope and harness, you name it. All of those things can be think, kind of sort of gamifying a little bit and providing incentives for people to get the things that the industry really wants them to have and disincentivizing them to, to waste or not necessarily ways, but to spend money and resources and time on things that aren't going to move the needle as much for them as these things here, right? Like Patterson's construction, you know, restoration claims training. If you if you put together, you know, a course for that, which honestly you don't really need to like guess what your viewers are going to want. That's what they're going to want, right? You put that together, and and people, it's pat, you know, they have to pass it. There's an exam, right? Then that goes in, and that gets people can get points that way. So it's something that we came up, me and Chris Stanley from IAPATH came up with um, as a way to kind of help adjusters narrow that path so that they know what they, what's really, really important, focus on these things, maybe help training companies like you um, to say, all right, well, here's the standard that we need, we want to uh, cal kind of calibrate the industry training too. And then for the firms to say, this is what this person actually knows. You know, they're ready to go, right? Because they could, they'll look at your profile and say, "All right, this person got a good score on the exam." You know, they have a, the all the equipment that we want them to have for this deployment. Call them, shoot them an email. Let's get them on the roster. Um, so it's a big deal. We've been working on it for a little while, and uh, we're very very excited about it. So, but yeah, it, it's Andy, awesome. I'm sure the firms love it. They do. They got they got very excited when we explained it. Some of them were like, "Man, I wish I had that idea." <laughs> so that tells me it was a good idea. Um, but man, I really appreciate you coming on, and I hope I, I helped answer your questions. And we can absolutely continue this conversation, you know, through email or whatever um, later on. But I really want to thank you for coming on and uh, you know agreeing to put your face and your absolutely outstanding set uh, on Adjuster TV. So. Um, thanks again, man. And, and I hope you have a great rest of the week and we'll catch up with you later. This is Adjuster TV.